Well, this is it, gang. This is the end of 2018, or at least essentially the end of 2018 for me. Because of the holidays and some personal projects I have going on, I'm just not going to be playing Legends on the Ladder until January. And as such, I felt like it was a good time for me to spend uh, the time off that I have uh, going through the data that I've collected and doing a follow-up video to a video I did last year around this time. So, if you guys are not familiar, uh, I track all of my game stats. I've been doing it for a long time, and when 2017 concluded, I did a video because it's often a hot-button topic about the Ring of Magicka. And I thought that this would be a great time to do a follow-up. Let's kind of revisit the Ring of Magicka and see what 2018 has taught us potentially, uh, or at a bare minimum, allow us to add to our data set, because uh, the data set that I have, in my opinion, is still not substantial enough. Uh, I said as much in 2017 in that my sample size is small, but it's the best that I can do. I can only really track my own games with any real accuracy. And I still think, and I stand by this, that some data is better than no data. And I would much rather take a look at what I can collect than just ignore it entirely. So uh, that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to, if you're not familiar with it, uh, put a link in the description that will send you to the original video I did after 2017. And then I'm going to start this video by re-explaining uh, the process that I use for tracking my games and then kind of setting up the uh, very minor analytics. Uh, this is nothing flashy, real basic stuff uh, that I'm going to show off in this video. And then uh, I also just wanted to... Um, just provide the the caveats because again you guys may not have been around or may not have seen that 2017 video so um, all of the data that you're gonna see here that I've collected is for uh, constructed on the competitive ladder so no tournaments that I've participated in no gauntlets no arena this is strictly if I'm playing on the ranked ladder in Elder Scrolls Legends now all of these games were taken between ranks 5 and Legend. Uh, I'm not trying to sound pretentious, but I've never not finished Legend. I'm always competing between ranks 5 and Legend, so whenever I'm tracking my games, uh, that's the uh, place that I'll be playing at, and so I'm just saying that because that speaks to, potentially anyway, quality of opponent. Um, yeah, so there's your caveats. Again, uh, only ranked ladder, no gauntlets, no tournaments, nothing like that, no arena. Uh, rank 5 to Legend. Uh, how I track my games. So uh, I've also done a video on this before, but I use a Google form mostly because uh, it allows me to track when I'm on mobile. So I can still pull this up in a browser on, on my phone and I do play a lot like on my lunch breaks at work and things like that. And I've never used any other deck trackers as a result uh, for a number of other reasons as well. Uh, but essentially there are decks here that I pick for me, whether or not I went first, opponent's class, opponent's deck type in terms of aggro, midrange, combo, control, or ramp. Uh, deck style is like for my own notes, you know, was I playing against conscription, etc., uh, etc., et and then the outcome. Um, those feed back to these monthly spreadsheets that I use for tracking uh, wins and losses. Uh, this is what I use to generate the menu. Uh, this is where the data goes, and then these analytics pages will tell me about uh, win-loss and, you know, win-loss going first and second and some win rates and, and so on and so forth. So uh, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, these uh, forms and sheets have had a couple of different uh, iterations. Obviously, I had to add uh, the houses when Houses of Morrowind came out for tracking, things like that. But the process has basically been the same throughout. And then if I come over here, uh, I have my archives, right? Because I do this monthly, so I can give myself like a monthly snapshot in terms of what did I play against recently, kind of give myself a monthly uh, meta snapshot for my own purposes, if you will. And then by doing this, I can always uh, revisit these later on um, for projects like what I've been doing. So... Uh, what I've done for this video is I've taken all of my monthly stuff just like I did in uh, the 2017 video and then uh, I pull it out and I dump it into just a local uh, SQL Server database uh, on my own local machine which then creates this table with all of my win results with a couple of extra fields like I add 
um, whether or not my deck is uh, proactive or reactive or whether my opponent's deck is proactive or reactive and then some like flags that I use for calculations later. And uh, this will probably be a good time for me to say uh, what I use as a, as a basis for these things. So um, when I am talking about deck types here, right? Um, basically, if the deck that I am playing or my opponent is playing is either aggro or mid-range, uh, I classify that as a proactive deck. In other words, I want to be the proactive aggressor in most cases. Uh, if the deck is a combo deck, a control deck, or a ramp deck, these are traditionally uh, decks that are more passive in the early game and then become proactive after they've either established control, got their combo, or ramped up. Um, and I, I classify these this way because it's really hard to get into uh, very, very specific matchups because then our data set gets even smaller. So I'm trying to uh, classify things in a broad enough sense that they are still going to be relevant, um, but paying attention to like what's important to the deck style. So that's uh, kind of what I am doing when I'm saying these proactive or reactive classifications. Now, after I dump it into the database, uh, I use Microsoft Visual Studio to make a SSRS report. Uh, this is not a flashy one, as I said, by any means. Uh, I set up a data set and then I, I create a bunch of like auto calculating things that we'll take a look at in a moment. And um, we'll see in here that I can apply some filters. So like right now, this is looking at everything that was from the 2017 version. So when I hit preview here, you're going to see stats that, again, will match up exactly to the stats that were in that 2017 video. So again, as a recap, if you didn't see that, though, the link will be in the description and I highly recommend you go check it out. Um, you'll see that uh, these were my overall win rates for going first and going second. Uh, these were my number of wins, number of losses, and then how that ends up becoming win rates, right? So uh, going second had a very small advantage, um, but they were incredibly close. And then this was a very uh, more drawn out, like archetype by archetype. And then lastly was the proactive versus reactives. And uh, I'll touch on this in a minute again, but I want to back up and I want to say before we go further... And before we talk about balance, I, I want you all to take a moment, pause the video if you have to, and I want you to say in your head, come up with a number on your own with what you think a reasonable uh, margin of difference is, right? So like right here, these are, these are neck and neck here for 2017. So before we go further, in your head, if you were to say, I think going first versus going second is balanced, that means that the win rates fall within X percent of each other, right? I want you to come up with that on your own because it's gonna be different for everybody and that's fine, but I think it's important that we all have this as our baseline. You got it? You, you figured out the number. You're saying as long as going first and second are within this range, this window, I'm comfortable because I want you to come up with that now and then see the numbers as opposed to seeing numbers and then finding a reason to be outraged. Okay? Okay. So now that we've done that, I also want to just provide some context about some other games, right? Um, chess, so not a card game, uh, is historically considered one of the more balanced games uh, ever played. However, there is an advantage for going first. Depending on the study, it's been anywhere between 2 and 5% in favor of white, meaning white would win, assuming equal skill, between uh, 52 and 55% of the time. So that is for a game that is widely considered to be very balanced. Obviously, Legends here uh, in 2017, uh, much closer than that. And in the past, when Direwolf Digital uh, would tell us things, they never outright fully released data. Uh, they had always said it was within 1% to 2% of each other, which is still slightly better than chess, um, but doesn't mean that it's stayed that way over time, and we'll take a look at that. Uh, but it is important to note that that's like where chess lands. Now, if you take a look at something like Gwent before Homecoming, uh, that had massive differences. If you take a look at a game like Hearthstone, that varies by meta. But if you even just Google like going first versus going second in Hearthstone, you'll see some Reddit threads that pop up where um, there are legitimately times in Hearthstone's lifespan where there was like 20% differences in win rate for going first and going second. That's a 
much, much larger uh, disparity. And magic has always been uh, kind of in the chess range. Um, there is an advantage for going first. Uh, Wizards of the Coast has never fully released anything, but all of these self-tracked stuff, uh, again, puts it somewhere at 5% or less, depending on the meta. So uh, I mentioned these things before we go forward and take a look at these uh, stats together for 2018 and then I'm also at the very end of this going to uh, combine 2017 and 2018 so that we get again a bigger data size so um, as we can see here 2017 very very close um, and then if we come back here because one of the things people always talk about is you know how do um, different decks fare against each other because uh, one of the common schools of thought is that uh, in an aggro versus aggro mirror, the ring is a much, much bigger decider. So in 2017, um, when I broke things down by proactive versus reactive, we can see that uh, in proactive versus proactive matchups, I had a 62 and almost a, a half uh, win rate. And then in proactive versus proactive going second, I had a 63 uh, and like a third, right? So it was less than 1% apart despite it being a very common school of thought, that there was a, a big difference uh, between them. Again, these are only my uh, my games, right? But uh, this, this was what I had. Uh, one of the things that always kind of stood out to me uh, when I was looking at these were actually that uh, reactive decks seemed to like going first in reactive versus reactive matchups. Um, things like that, but again, this was this was just 2017. It was a simpler time back then. Uh, the power level of cards were uh, not what they are today, and I mention that because I'm now going to go apply the filter in a different way, where we only see 2018. And before we do it, uh, I, I want you to know that I expected to see what we're about to see, which is that um, these margins have widened. And that's because the power level of cards have increased. And so anytime that the power level of cards has increased, it's going to exacerbate known issues. It's going to push boundaries further, right? And how, it, there's no question about it. Between, you know, Forgotten Hero Collection, Houses of Morrowind, uh, the power level of cards has pretty drastically increased uh, in 2018 when compared to 2017. So I'm going to come into my data set properties. I'm going to go to this filter. And instead, we're going to go ahead and change it and say, hey, give me everything greater than, uh, you know, December, blah, blah, blah. And so now that we've reapplied that, I'll go ahead and hit preview, and we're going to see some changes. And the first change we're going to see is in the overall win rates. So again, um, where before it was a very, very close margin in favor of going second, uh, the power level of cards has increased, and as such, our, our issues have been exacerbated. Uh, here, uh, there is some other things to note. It is a smaller sample size in terms of raw games played. So it means I played less overall Legends in 2018 than I did in 2017. Uh, that has a lot to do with that I did a lot of traveling, uh, both for my own personal work and then for casting for things like Legends. Um, and that interrupted my ability to play. Uh, but the sample size is still, uh, decent. Um, and again, I stand by that while it is certainly not something that's going to give us a really high confidence interval if you follow like actual statistics, um, some data is still better than no data. Uh, so I'm not going to disregard it entirely. And it does still, for the most part, come close to aligning with what we saw in 2017. So I, I'm uh, at least emboldened by the level of consistency I see. Uh, but yeah. Uh, it does look like we're approaching about a 1.5% uh, favor in going second. Um, much, much bigger, again, exacerbated in my opinion, likely by the, uh, the quality of cards. Now, um, the first time I did this video in 2017, I went through a bunch of the individual matchups here. But because my sample size is smaller and because some of my deck choices are even... Um, smaller still like i barely played any what i would consider to be true ramp decks in 2018 i think there's not a lot of value in going through this for just 2018 maybe combining it will take a, a brief look um, i'm going to leave this here if you want to pause it and take a look but you'll very quickly notice that uh, there are some matchups that i just didn't even run into on ramp um, i played a lot of aggro and i played a lot of mid-range so uh, those 
those stats are going to be the best of the bunch in terms of like analyzing what you see on the screen if you do pause it but uh i just don't feel like i had a quality sample size to really break this down the way i did for the 2017 year and even then if you go back and watch that video it was a little suspect um so we're gonna go here we're gonna go to what i think is uh, what most people are interested in and this is the uh, proactive versus reactive breakdown so win rates overall uh, again, this top one is just for everything, right? So I had, uh, if I'm playing a proactive versus a proactive deck, a decent win rate. Uh, proactive versus reactive, a much, much bitter win, uh, better win rate, excuse me, or bitter if it made you bitter because you were the reactive player. Um, this doesn't surprise me for a number of reasons, and it has a lot to do with how uh, aggressive decks uh, whether it was mid-range or just true like aggro, uh, they had a lot of really good tools in 2018. Everything from Token Crusader to uh, the first version of Halalu to the second version of Halalu. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people are going to remember uh, the crazy, you know, Uprising Scout decks, and they're going to remember Nixox, and they're going to remember Conscription, but uh, the fact of the matter is, and I've been saying this for a long time, uh, those decks were more popular than they were outright oppressive, in my opinion. I felt like aggro uh, was in a good place and has been in a good place for a lot of 2018. Warrior has been phenomenal for most of the year. Uh, that's another great deck to add to the list. And I really feel like those decks kind of were the boogeyman of their metas because of not just popularity, but also because they won in very memorable, flashy, uh, and depressing ways if you're on the receiving end of it. Um, that being said, aggro has been in a good place for a lot of the year. So the fact that I'm seeing this, uh, you know, my win rate of proactive versus reactive decks was incredibly high, does not shock me one bit, and it is very reflective of kind of what I was saying through most of the year. Uh, meanwhile, you'll notice uh, my reactive win rates are much less than my proactive. Uh, this is twofold. One, I just played a lot more proactive decks. I probably am just more skillful with those lists. But two, um, again, I just felt like most of your reactive decks were not in a good place. I'm not saying uh, that there weren't good ones, because there were, but there's a reason why in most of the metas uh, there ends up being like one, maybe two good reactive decks, whether it's a combo deck or a control deck. Uh, and then a field of aggro decks designed to, like, beat them. Um, and that's just because aggro had a lot of great tools. And, you know, for a long time, your reactive decks, like, relied on Drain Vitality. And then when that was kind of nerfed or taken away, it relied still on Ice Storm. Um, you know, in, in Talvani's case now, they have a great control package that relies on a number of really good tools. But uh, it's kind of like just Talvani in many ways because it kind of pushes other things out. So... Uh, your your proactive decks, in my opinion, you know, Withered Hand Cultus has been around for a long time. Ash Berserker was unchecked for a bit. The original uh, Spooky Mansion of Halalu was pretty powerful, so uh, I'm not shocked by this. Now, this was overall, so now let's go ahead and take a look at uh, win rates for going first and going second and look for the differences between the two. Um, so here, right, proactive... Uh, versus proactive, 60% uh, going first. Proactive versus proactive, now we see a much larger disparity than we saw in 2017. Um, this is like four and three quarters percent higher. So again, uh, likely due to the power level now exacerbating things. Um, the ability of many of the aggressive decks to get fast starts in 2018, I think really helped inflate this. Uh, Halalu decks that had the ring and could go, you know, into uh, Skulk, into three cost manor, into like raiding party, um, you know, or even just like Skulk into like Oathman, Oathman manor. I mean, there were some insane openers uh, that were available <laughs> for a lot of the year. And I think the ring just kind of exacerbated that for a bit. So I'm not shocked that this is significantly higher. Now that being said, um, depending on where you mentally picked your balance thing could still be within it because it's still less than 5%. I know a lot of you probably are saying to yourself like there's no way, uh, but uh, this was what it was for my games, right? Um, 
5% is still reasonable. That's still chess levels of balance. Uh, could it be closer? Sure. But it, it's not the worst I've ever seen for card games by a long shot. Um, then when we look at uh, reactive versus proactive decks, uh, versus reactive versus proactive decks, first and going second, now we see a, kind of a startling disparity, and this is something that I would not have expected. I'm actually incredibly shocked by this outcome because almost everybody that I know would have likely said they would prefer to have the ring if they are on the reactive deck playing against a proactive deck. However, there is a 13, almost 14 uh, point difference. Uh, we'll go 13 because of the rounding, right? 13, 13 percentage point difference in my win rate if I'm a reactive player playing against a proactive player and going first versus going second. That's massive. Like, that is... It's almost kind of mind-boggling. Um, I, I, I almost can't even come up with a good explanation for it. It's, it's entirely possible that it's reflective of a, uh, my own personal play style. It's entirely possible that it has to do with, um, you know, maybe they expend all of their resources sooner because they have the ring, and by the time that you make it to Ice Storm, you'll wipe more off their board. Um, maybe they overcommit with the ring. Uh, I, I legitimately am mind boggled by, by this look. Um, but there it is. Uh, meanwhile, looking at the other side of things, uh, this is something that does not surprise me. So going second, uh, roughly 2% higher win rate going um, proactive versus reactive decks uh, going second for me. Um, so that that's something that stands out. So like when I am the proactive player going against a reactive player, I have a 2% higher win rate going second. When I am the reactive player going against the proactive player, there's a 13% difference this direction, right? These these should kind of mirror each other in some ways, and they don't. Um, that's, that's a bit mind-boggling to me. Uh, meanwhile, on the other side of things as well, we have reactive versus reactive, and uh, there's a large difference here as well. Uh, I'm not shocked by this. I'm a little shocked that it's as high as it is. Uh, again, this is probably power level of cards exacerbating things, but... Um, typically, if I'm a controller or a combo player and I'm playing against another controller or a combo player, I want the ring, and it's because when you get to the end game, um, being able to play your broken combo or your uh, broken bomb, you know, conscription or whatever it is first, uh, is a pretty big deal. I, I know that a lot of people like to focus on the ring opener of like 2-drop, 3-drop, 4-drop, but the fact of the matter is, in a control mirror or a combo mirror, um, being able to play my Nixox combo first, as opposed to you playing your Nixox combo first, is literally game deciding. Um, like, far more than trying to curve in the aggro mirror. Uh, if you get that off, like, you just win. Or, like, if I play Conscription and you don't have the Ice Storm, I probably just win. Uh, there's a lot more on the line, a lot more at stake in my opinion, for these reactive versus reactive games and having uh, a, a spike in power level, the, the difference in, you know, 10 cost and 11 cost and 12 cost cards or combos at that stage in the game is, in my opinion, a much greater difference than 2-drop, 3-drop, 4-drop. So I'm not surprised that this is a, a bigger gap here, but uh, this, this one here versus the other one uh, is very much a surprise to me. So, uh, you know, what, what does this tell us? Well, um, there is potentially some gaps here. Um, you know, proactive versus proactive, uh, still within the, the chess range. Uh, here uh, as well, these two within the chess range. But these, these ones down here uh, are, are a little bit troublesome to me. And I, I would want to do a deeper dive if I could. And it is, it is a bit concerning. It's certainly a lot different from the 2017 data. So is it a problem with the ring or is it a problem with the the cards themselves? That I mean, that's, that's a legitimate question that we're going to have to uh, ask. Uh, during the 2017 video, I said that I don't think that you balance the game around um, like one matchup, right? So uh, if just hypothetically, right? 
just hear me out. I'm not saying that's the case, and uh, my numbers honestly don't show it. But let's just say Agro Warrior versus Agro Warrior has like a 20% difference. But every other deck art type is like 5% or less. I don't think you balance the Ring of Magicka because Warrior versus Warrior has a polarized matchup with the Ring. I think that in that case, you probably try to address cards that exist in that deck. Um, or that's up to the people who build the decks to modify their game plan accordingly, right? Like if you build a deck and it does one thing and it has to go all in on that and then you're not losing because, uh, you know, you get the ring and then you are losing because you don't get the ring because you're all in on this one strategy, then that's that's something with the deck in my opinion. That is not a ring of magic a problem. That is a, that is a deck building problem. Um, so I don't think that you, you balance the ring of magicka for one like particular matchup um but more so in 2018 than i saw in 2017 i am seeing some uh some bigger gaps now again this is a a smaller uh data sample than i would like it's entirely possible if this uh doubled or tripled in size then things would calm down but uh, this is the only data that i have so uh, i would say that i would actively monitor things going forward and i would certainly be uh, interested in seeing what this looks like after we get some expansions because one of the other things that we experienced in 2018 was a, a content drought right i mean there's no uh, there's no point in avoiding the subject um so more so than ever in legends history uh, we also had decks that were fine-tuned way more than in any other period of the game and what i mean by that is that like People have been playing the same decks and the same archetypes for so long that like all the tricks are known. Nobody's innovating and like really taking uh, the ladder or the tournament scene by storm. Uh, they haven't been doing it for a while now. And I think that that also uh, plays a pretty big role in exacerbating uh, the percentages a bit. So um, there, there is certainly more cause for concern uh, this year than that. And, uh, you know, I said I was going to do it, and so I kind of want to go do it um, just because it does provide us with a larger data set. Now, it, it's less current, right? Um, but we're going to go ahead and just delete this filter. And now we're going to take a look at things for, for the past two years, essentially, right? So if I say all of 2017 and all of 2018 together, uh, this is what it looks like. So, again, uh, going second, still favored. Uh, when you combine the two, uh, the advantage of going second shrinks because it was, you know, exacerbated by 2018. And in, in my opinion, the power level of the cards increasing. But if we're looking at like historical legends, still very close. Uh, again, uh, I'm going to leave this screen up. So if you want to take a look at uh, like two years worth of data and archetypes, um, you can pause it. You can kind of look at some numbers. Uh, I still don't feel like sample sizes are that great for a lot of these. Uh, I just haven't played a ton of ramp. Um, the aggro and mid-range numbers are, are probably pretty solid. I have a big sample size there. Um, but again, now, uh, let's see if things calm down a bit when we expand our sample size, right? So uh, proactive versus proactive, proactive versus reactive, blah, 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 so on and so forth, right? Um, so here, proactive versus proactive, again, um, one and a half percent, roughly two and a half percent, something like that. Um, I'm bad at math, you know, uh, yeah, two and a, two and something percent, uh, difference here favoring going second, uh, proactive versus reactive again, favoring going second by uh, a small margin. Um, but again, we still see this really big gap right uh this is still concerning even when you have two years worth of data um the reactive deck going first versus going second has a really big swing in its favor and then things calmed down a bit here after we got some historical context if you will so um i i i wish i knew what to make of that i would have to like really i think go through matchup by matchup and see if there was just something unfavorable there. Um, but uh, at least when you look at two years worth of data, outside of this like one anomaly, the other stuff I think still looks pretty healthy, right? Uh, going back to what I said earlier, you know, think about what you had in your mind. You said 
uh, to yourself, hey, if if the win rates are within this, you know, number of percentage points, then I think things are balanced. Um, you know, providing some examples from other games like chess, where it can be anywhere between two and five percent, um, two years worth of data. So the biggest sample size that I can provide personally uh, shows that most of this is still pretty balanced. Something wonky is going on here, um, but the rest of them, you know, they, they show some favoritism, but it's nothing like completely out of control, right? Um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, I see a lot more people saying I lost a game because of the ring uh, than 2% of the time, uh, I would wager. So, you know, bl blaming your losses on the ring, you're allowed to do that like, you know, somewhere between two and five times out of a hundred. Just throwing that out there, people who like to do that. But uh, yeah, um, 2018, definitely we saw the spread widen. Um, we saw the gap widen. Again, I, I think that had a lot to do with the content drought. I think it had a lot to do with the power level of cards increasing. Um, Forgotten Hero Collection and Houses of Morrowind really ramped up the power level in terms of the game and the you know the addition of houses really ramped up the power level in terms of the the decks and what they could do so i'm not really i'm not really shocked that there are more ways to take advantage of the ring of magicka now um i would still say that i don't necessarily think things are bad enough that i would say like hey we need to change the ring of magicka uh, but i would say that they are at least trending in a position where it's worth monitoring now um, I've long said, like, anytime the Ring of the Magicka uh, discussions arise, I get tagged because I track my stats, and I'm usually the guy that says, like, you know, actually, it's not as bad as it seems, and so I get labeled as, like, this, uh, like, pro Ring of Magicka person, but that's never been the case. Um, I'm not in love with the Ring of Magicka. I'm not friends with it on Facebook. I didn't design it. I didn't invent it. I've got no skin in the game. Um, the, only, the only skin I have is in, you know, tracking and analysis and being objective um, and i've long said and i stand by this that the moment that the ring of magicka um, stops being unfair uh, is the first time that i will you know be on your side um, do i think it is unfair right now uh, based on 2018 data i would still say probably not unfair probably not um, it's still within 5% or less in almost uh, every way that I've looked at it for, for your matchups. And that's chess levels. So I, I don't know what else you want. I mean, you could you could say like, hey, it needs to be closer. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd love for it to be closer, but that's, uh, that's a pretty big undertaking and it would require a lot of testing and a lot of extra data to actually like prove to me that making changes are gonna really uh, not swing things drastically in the other direction. So. Um, I think chess levels of balance is still pretty good, personally, but they are trending in a scary direction. And so uh, I think active monitoring is important. Um, I hope that Sparky takes that stance. I hope that Sparky is in a position where they can track this sort of thing, monitor it, and uh, if necessary, uh, make, make the appropriate changes. But, um, you know, things are... Things are not where they were in 2017, that's for sure. Um, maybe at the end of uh, 2019, things will have uh, gotten worse. Maybe they will have, you know, flattened out. Maybe they will have gotten better. Um, who knows, right? The only thing we can do is continue tracking, continue monitoring, which is where uh, I want to end this video. Um, I've done this for two years. And anytime a Ring of Magic a discussion comes up, I always say like, okay, like sweet, show me, show me your data, show me your stats, because I've I've got two years worth now, right? Um, that's cool that you tracked it for a month, but a month doesn't mean anything. Like I can go show show you a month where, uh, you know, going first I had like a 15% higher win rate, and I can go show you a month where going second I had like a 15% higher win rate. Uh, a month is like nothing. In fact, uh, as I've said a few times here, even me tracking for a full year is nowhere near a proper sample size. I still feel like some data is better than no data, and uh, that's where I'm going with this, but it leaves a lot to be desired. Um, but all we can do is track and monitor and uh, keep an eye on things. 
So I hope that you guys start. Um, I will also say that this is probably the last ring video that I'll do because I don't I don't want to be the only one doing it. I'm gonna I'm passing the torch here. I want somebody else to track for a year. This is this is my call to you. Um, I've done it for two years. If if you want to reach out and contact me, I'm happy to share uh, all of the data that I've personally collected thus far uh, with anybody uh, if they want to start their own venture. But um, you know, uh, in my experience, nobody nobody kind of cares anyway. <laughs> like I keep saying, like let's track our data, let's show the data, let's let's do this stuff, and then everybody comes up with excuses to uh, like mentally justify their their stance on the ring anyway. So. Um, this, this is probably going to be the last ring video that I do. Uh, I'm passing the torch. If somebody else wants to, to do this in the future, great. Um, but, but here you have it. Two years worth of data. Uh, 2017, 2018, and then the combined data sets. Um, most of which were fairly close, minus uh, one weird anomaly. And uh, yeah, uh, as always, I want to know what you guys think. So, uh, you know post some stuff in the comments. Uh, do you track your data? What what do you see when you track it? Um, what what are what are you tracking it across? Because again, I track my data across all decks of all archetypes. Um, I don't know, I just, I wanna hear from other people and I wanna, I'm really hoping that somebody else will, will pick this up uh, and, and do this kind of uh, tracking and analysis justice. It would be even better if somebody came along and had a proper deck tracker that could aggregate data at a much larger uh, level. Um, Ecstasy with his deck tracker in the past was able to do that and had even said that he saw win rates were very, very close when he was tracking. Um, provided some examples, I think, once. I know some other players have tracked their data in the past and found them to be very, very close. Um, but I, I don't want to be the only one. So somebody else... Please pick it up, do it in the future. Uh, if you made it this far through all of my rambling, uh, you're a saint because uh, I, I can't even stand to listen to my own self-talk. So you, you, are, uh, you are a big, big winner, big gold star in my book. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for watching. Until next time, may you walk on worm sands.